Hey, man, how's Stacy doing today? Doing better? Or? Yeah. I fear if she's doing real good, she'd be here. <laughs> Amen. Take your Bibles this evening to the book of Ruth, if you would. Book of Ruth. Back there, kind of snuck in between Judges and 1 Samuel. Ruth. Kind of an odd story, but... Uh, quite interesting and quite illuminating as to the habits and the customs and manners of Israel. And uh, it explains some things that uh, are not explained anywhere else in the Bible about the custom of uh, transferring property and buying and selling things and throwing shoes and, and all that kind of business. You know, what in the world is that guy? It's just a custom that they had. And if you don't have a Bible, you wouldn't know what it was. That uh, J. Vernon McGee, that poor guy, he's a pretty interesting uh, Bible teacher, we were talking about voices and presentation. He had a voice that somehow it uh, just is raspy and it, it was kind of magnetic. It's kind of like the Billy Graham voice or uh, what I call the radio voices that people love to hear them. It's too bad some of them just don't have anything to say. I, I mean, I wish I had a voice like that that everybody said, wow, I can't wait to hear that. I have one that's just kind of like fingernails on a chalkboard. The American standard is closest, closest <laughs> Yeah, it must have been on must have been on a bookshelf somewhere because it sure was. Why, why don't you use the American standard? <laughs> yeah, why didn't you use the original? <laughs> hey, man, people are crazy. That's all it comes down to. Everybody crazy about uh, the Bible says they're mad upon their idols, whatever it is that they hold up there. Uh, the Book of Ruth, uh, chapter one. Let's read here from uh, verse six on down to about verse eighteen, and it'll uh, it'll kind of sweep into a big uh, big heap all that we're going to talk about tonight, and then we'll spread the dust from there. In uh, verse 6, Then she arose with her daughter. They, they'd been out in this land. They, there was a famine that drove him to that land. They, family members die, and they all of a sudden they realize, man, it's, it's time to get out of here. We shouldn't be here. Verse 6, And she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard that in the country of Moab how the Lord had visited His people in giving them bread. Wherefore, she went forth to the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and uh, they went on their way to return into the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, we read this just recently in connection with something else. And it's interesting how people can see the same person, they can have the same kind of general relationship, they can have the same walk, and yet see the other so differently. And you wonder, what is that? There's just something in, in that human connection, and never minimize what that is. Because that human connection, I think, is something that God develops in a kindred spirit, in a like-minded spirit. Uh, talking to uh, Brother Jim and other folks over the, over the years, you go to churches all over the countryside. When you hit a Bible-believing church, you might not know a single soul in there, but you feel at home. You, you feel like... I'm not threatened here. I, I, I don't feel like I have to be on my guard to the same level I do almost any place else. You just feel, like, well, it's going to be okay. Yeah. And uh, it's the same way with some people. You meet some people, you take to them. Some people, man, it's just all of the barriers and the red lights go off and the bells ding. It's just look out, look out. Sometimes it's just bad judgment. Sometimes what you had for lunch, but sometimes it's God warning you, be careful. So anyway, uh, uh, verse 7, Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. So they're on their way out of that land of, uh, of Moab, going back to Judah. And Naomi said uh, unto her two daughters-in-law, Go return each, of, each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. She, they've been good, good wives to, to her sons. They, they've been good daughters-in-law to her. No, they're not leaving with Ill, any ill will or bad feelings. The Lord grant you that ye may find uh, rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she uh, kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. Then uh, they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters. Go your way, for I'm too old to have an husband. If I should say I have hope, uh, if I should 
have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would you tarry for them till they were grown? Boy, just, just the reality of life, you, how long are you going to wait? How long are you going to live your life? And just that patience. Would you stay, uh, would you stay for, the, uh, for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. But Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but, uh, but Ruth clave unto her. That, that word clay, anybody know what a meat cleaver is? It's a heavy blade that's, that's meant to separate pieces of meat. It, it cuts them asunder. So cle claving is something that's sticking together. So I'm going to stick with you. When, you. when you go, I'm sticking with you. Uh, you're, not, you're not shaking me off that, like that. But Ruth, verse 14, clave unto her. And she said, Behold, my sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after her, thy, uh, thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people and thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfast minded to go with her, she left speaking unto her. This idea of cleaving and, uh, and whatnot, I want to preach a message here at the end of the year, things we should cleave to, things that we ought to just just sink our, our fingers into and hang on with every ounce of our, uh, our existence because the world, the flesh, and the devil are trying to separate us from those things. And it's only going to be our love for the truth, our love for the Lord Jesus that holds us fast to these things. Ruth is the, one of the uh, Gentile women mentioned in Matthew chapter 1. It's in verse 5 there in the genealogy of the Messiah that came to save Israel. Those Moabites were a, a very reprobate people at large. And uh, they were not allowed to have anything to deal with Israel for uh, generations. And yet here they are, pops up in there. Picture of God's grace, a Gentile comes into that genealogy when the Jewish people didn't want anything to do with them. Way back in, uh, look at me in Genesis chapter 2. Talk about some things that we ought to cleave to. And I listen, I, before I even say anything, I recognize that the, the structure of this world, the folly of mankind, the decisions that other people make that we have nothing we can say about. So don't come to me later and say, Preacher, I would do that. But, you know, I, I understand. I understand all that. But I want to point out, if, if you and I and the people we love are doing what God wants us to do, we ought to make sure that we uh, honor God by hanging on to all of that. Hang on tight. Genesis chapter 2 and verse, uh, uh, verse 23. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, and the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. This idea of cleaving, Ruth clave to her. She says, I'm going to go where you go. What you do is what I'm going to do. Your God's my God. Where you live, where I'm going to live. We're going to be like one. Boy, I tell you what, you ever find a friend like that? You found a, a real treasure. And if you find a wife that is, that is uh, worthy of, uh, of the Lord's uh, name called Christian... You want to grab onto her and hang on to her and hang on to him uh, as a husband and leave absolutely no room in that relationship for the flesh to, to climb in, for the world to creep in, and for the devil to, to slither in. Because the minute that uh, that, that uh, uh, union that God has joined together is severed, life gets tough. My, my dad was... Uh, a divorce when I was, I think, about two, maybe three. And, uh, you know, all his life he had regrets. And there wasn't a thing he could do about it. It wasn't my dad's fault. It's somebody else's fault. You and I live by what other people do. We're, we're subject to their decisions as well. But all I'm saying is, is this. When God gives you somebody that you love, somebody to care for, you hang on. And you put up a fight. And you struggle for them.
And all of the things that happen in this world, don't let the world convince you you can do better. You can do something else. It'll be easier some other way. You know, it's kind of like, a, I hate to put it this way in the, in the same context, but it's kind of like abortion. Man, some of the comments I read on the, on the Internet about people that have had abortion, some of them are just uh, overjoyed that they had an abortion. They're just so liberating. And, so, and you think, man, that, that's just creepy, anybody that could think like that. And then there's other ones that you realize so-and-so's name is in the obituary because 10 years ago they had an abortion and could never get over the fact they murdered their own child. Just, just the haunting of that, the, the, the depth and the pressure and the weight of all of that stuff. God gives us things in life to hang on to and to treasure. And if they're not treasured, they become a source of shame and guilt. That's why Adam and Eve could be naked, no shame, no guilt. They're one flesh. Why would they, why would be, they be embarrassed? It'd be like somebody being embarrassed in the shower by themselves. Cleave to your spouse. God will bless. Don't let friends, relatives, anybody, anything, any circumstance get between the two of you. You know, when you, when you uh, think about the manner in which people join themselves in, in marriage today, it's almost scary. It, it's almost like just default. Well, you know, just, it just kind of worked out that way. Or we just happened to be kind of in the same side of the planet at the same time. And we got married. Yeah, I don't know. It's, yeah, I got a tax break. Uh, you know, we had kids, so it just seemed like a, a kind of a good, you know, reasonable thing to do. Listen, make it a choice. Make it a desirable option in your life. Don't live yourself. I have grandchildren now, and some of them are getting old enough to start kind of some hazy, fuzzy, far-off thoughts about girlfriends and marriage and all that kind of stuff. And my advice to them each time I talk with them is, is live your life so that there's no regrets. Treat your girlfriends, your friends in such a way that if you ever uh, decide uh, you and I are not meant to be together, you can at least be friends and there's no hangover of guilt or shame or anything else. So that every time you break up with, uh, with somebody, you don't have to go find a whole new bunch of friends. You've just got somebody that, well, that didn't work out. We'll, we'll move along, see what the Lord will do and what will, what will bless. Because I realize uh, at, at my age, how few people you have that stick with you through your whole life. Some of you probably realize this. How many of you know 10 people today that you graduated high school with and have seen them within the last five years? Yeah. One. I, I have, yeah, two. I have uh, uh, people, when I graduated, if I knew 10 people, I'd be having my graduating class. Now, there we're probably uh, maybe 100. I don't even remember. It's been so long ago. You know how many of those people I've seen since I graduated? It's been a long time. Probably four, five. You say, well, you moved out of the state. Yeah, I know, but I haven't seen them. I had some good friends, just haven't seen them. And when you don't see people, you lose contact with them. I have some Navy buddies. I don't necessarily see them, but I'm in contact with them, and I appreciate it. You know why? We have memories. We have things that go back, way back. And, Think about those things. Some of them I'd rather not. And some of them are, are quite pleasant memories. <laughs> but uh, try and hang on to the friends God gives you. Hang on to, the, to the, uh, the, the wife that God gave you. Hang on to the husband God gave you. And put up a fight to death over those things. Don't give up easy. Don't give in. Don't throw in the towel easy. There's something else. The Bible says that we ought to... Uh, uh, since we're uh, in that same spousal arrangement with the Lord Jesus Christ, we ought to be close to Him. He's going to hang on to us forever. He's never going to give up on us. He says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. That doesn't mean you can't leave Him and forsake Him. I don't know why you'd want to. What would possibly be gained? How could a person advantage themselves by being a joint heir with the God of all creation and then saying, well, I don't think I want anything to do with you. You're not good enough for me. You're to this or you're to that. You know, what we ought to do is just appreciate the, the privilege of being joined to him. Cling to our Savior. Cleave to our Savior. Don't try and leave him behind in troubles and trials. Uh, sometimes in opportunities, people leave the Savior behind. In the midst of all of these things, they ought to draw us closer to Him. They ought to, this uh, 
this idea of cleaving to the Lord. I've, I've seen people say, well, if you knew what happened to me, you'd quit too. And man, if I knew what happened to you, I'd hang on to the Lord tighter than ever. The worse your life gets, the more horrible things happen in your life. The more, just like Job, you're going to find out God's right. He's doing something, and he's still on my side. He hasn't thrown me out. He hasn't rejected me. He's still working for me. He's trying to perfect something. He's trying to work on something. He's trying to prove something to somebody. My only job is to hang on to him tight, wrap around him, and don't let go. You look at some of these world-class wrestlers. You know why they're so good? I mean, these, these guys are strong, they're wiry, but they're not punchers, they're not kickers, they're not fighters. They can grab onto somebody and you can't get them off. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I've seen some of these guys, they'll tackle a giant, they'll get wrapped around that guy, they look like a vine growing around him. And pretty soon the, the big guy's laying on the ground, <laughs> let me up. Hey, what's that all about? They're just not going to let go. They're going to win the fight. Not by a brutal beating, but simply by hanging on, outlasting the competition, outlasting everybody else. God has put on us the desire of everlasting life. He's put the spirit of the living God in us. He's given us a level of determination that ought to cause us to cleave when the rest of the world says, man, if I was in your shoes, I'd quit. Well, if I was in your shoes, I would probably would have quit. But since I'm in mine and the Holy Spirit's in here with me, I guess I can hang on a little bit longer and a little bit longer, and a little bit longer. And all i got to hang on to is the rest of today. Now, it'll only be 24 hours tomorrow. Each day goes by. Hang on tight. God certainly knew Israel's heart, didn't he? Israel's heart was to let go. Israel's heart was to turn away. Israel's heart was to do anything but follow the Lord. Let me give you a list of illustrations here from the book of Deuteronomy. Starting in, in uh, chapter 10. And each one of these things is a reason in your life and in my life to cleave to the Lord. God gave these to Israel by example. We certainly would do well to take heed to them. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse uh, 17 says, For the Lord uh, your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and terrible which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. You know what? Nobody can bribe God away from you. There's no appeal men can make to God to put you in a bad light in his eyes. Look down here, verse 20. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, thou shalt, uh, him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou cleave and swear by his name. Hey, nobody but God. I, I went uh, talking to somebody this morning, went to... Uh, Years ago to a, a little church out in a, a place called Rough and Ready, California. Interesting name. It's right near Lake Tahoe. It's up uh, near Placerville. And that's where the old, uh, uh, the, the 49 uh, gold miners were at in Placerville, Rough and Ready. That's probably why it was called Rough and Ready. And it had a very eclectic group of people, a Bible-believing church up there. And after the, after the meeting, we had a... a uh, camp meeting there, got to preach with some, uh, some fellows and had a good time. The preacher invited us over to his house after, uh, after it was over. Uh, and he showed us a movie. And this, this, this guy is preaching as a, a, an older fellow and had a funny kind of a whiny voice. And that guy had preached and the, 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 the gist of his message was, ain't God good. There ain't nobody like him. And every point that makes it, ain't nobody like him. By the end of that message, you just, wanted to, you just want to jump out of your skin. You were so excited that the God that had no like anywhere in any level at all had chosen you to, to join with him. And today, well, it's just church. If you think it's just church, you just missed it. If you think, well, you, know, you just got to live right. If you think it's just living right, you missed it. It's not just living right. It's living right for him. To honor the one who's given us everything. So why ought we to cleave to him? He's the God of all gods. He's the God of holiness. He's the God that stood by us through all of our trials and all of our temptation. And again reminded us, hath not he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Look at chapter 11. In verse 1. Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God and keep his charge and his statutes and his judgments and his commandments always. 
This, uh, and know ye this day, for I speak not with your children, which have not known, which have not seen the chastisement of the Lord your God, His greatness, His mighty hand, His stretched out arm, and His miracles and the acts which He did in the, in the midst of Egypt unto Pharaoh and the king of Egypt and all his land. He says, I'm not going to talk to the children. They don't know what God's done. These young fellows, they've probably seen something the Lord's done. But you take uh, a little Audrey and some of these kids, you know what they know? Jesus, mom, dad, family, uh, that's all they know. It's up to you and I to convey what great things God has done and God's perpetually and, and ongoing fashion reminding us of how good He is. In, uh, in verse uh, 7 it says, But your eyes have seen all the great acts of the Lord which He did. And you might be sitting here and I say, Well, I haven't seen God do anything great for me. He saved you, didn't He? You realize that's something that nobody else in the world could do? You are the miracle. You are going to heaven. You were infused with eternal life from the living God. You've been the benefactor of His death on that cross. You're the recipient of all of His mercy and grace and goodness. And the kids think, oh, I don't want to go to church. Well, come on, we have to go. It not to be, come on, we have to go. We ought to delight to go. We ought to delight to be where God's people are. We ought to be delighted to be able to lift up our voices and sing, How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for the, for the, for the church in His excellent word. These are things the world can't sing. And God looks down and He says, You thought about me. I like it. I like it. Keep smiling. In verse 22 of that uh, same chapter, it says, For ye shall diligently keep all these commandments which I have commanded you uh, to do them and to love the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways and to cleave unto Him. You notice that, uh, that these things end with a cleave unto Him? Because can't you do what God said and still not cleave to Him? You know the Pharisees' problems, that rich young ruler's problems, they, we've done all these things from our youth up. And he says, yeah, but you didn't follow me. They, they'd done the outwork of it, but the heart was never connected. That cleaving to the, to the, uh, the benefactor that brought him up out of the dirt, uh, in, uh, I believe it's in Isaiah, where God talks about he found uh, Israel in a field and, uh, in blood and washed it in nature and made it ever so clean and wrapped it in swaddling clothes. And then it says, what did you ever do for me? Everything. <laughs> Made them. Brought them out. You know what we ought to remember? He's the Lord our God. You've seen His power exercise for you. He took the devil and put him at a distance. Took hell and forbid you to go there. And promised you heaven. And whether that man believes there's a mansion for him in glory, I can't imagine where the, where the king of eternity lives is not a glory that makes mansions a, uh, a minor note on his charts. That's how we would understand it. How would God call something that had foundation stones, uh, maybe as big as a car made out of diamonds and sapphires and all of those precious stones, and you want to, well, he's got a little shack there for you, a little lean-to. God's building tiny houses for the saints so he can squeeze them all in there. Listen, God's not limited by the things that we think of. God doesn't I'm going to have to worry about how, how am I going to mortgage all this stuff? How am I going to provide for these people? He filled the heavens with His power and His majesty. He watches over everything out there and He says, it's the works of my hands. When, when He describes creation, He talks about the earth and the plants and the animals, all those kind of things, and He made the stars also. Think about this for just a second. If you could take one of those stars and run a gas line to it so that you could fill up cars with it, you think you could make a few bucks on it? You could fuel every car on this planet to the end of eternity by one of those things. And God says, I made a trillion or so of them out there just to kind of brighten up the night sky. Just make it look good. Isn't it great out there? Ain't nobody like him. You look up in that sky and you think, man, there just ain't nobody like him. He does that just to keep the dark away. And his children can look up and say, my father has made those lights just to light up the night. 
we ought to cleave to Him. In Deuteronomy 13, Deuteronomy 13, if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of, of dreams and says, I have a dream, <laughs> and give thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, where have he spoken to thee, saying, let us go after other gods? In other words, if he really does it, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the word of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey him, his voice, and shall serve him and cleave unto him. You know what that's all about? To prove you. How are you going to learn whether that God's telling you, that, that prophet's telling you the truth? How are you going to learn whether uh, what he's steering you to is right or wrong? Listen, once you turn away from that Bible, you've got no hope of learning anything that God's up to. You, you've got to trust people. And I don't know about you. I've been around long enough to know uh, it isn't a matter of everybody being dishonest, but it certainly is not a matter of everybody being right. You, you can be just as, uh, just as dead following somebody that's wrong as somebody that's lying. You've got to know which way is the right way. Over the years, I've had people tell me in witnessing and conversations, well, I don't need a preacher to tell me what's right. Yes, you do. This world doesn't know what's right. The Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. God acknowledges right up front, repeats that verse twice in Proverbs. You think you know what's right? You don't have any idea. You think doing good, you think obeying the Ten Commandments, you think uh, uh, the golden rule, you think uh, uh, being a peacemaker is going to get you to heaven. You think because you're, you're, uh, you're merciful, you're going to see God. Without Jesus Christ, you're not going to see anything but fire and flames, torment and torture. Say, why is that? Because God's so mean? No, because you won't do what he told you to do. God's honest. God's straightforward. God doesn't try and hide what he's up to. He's trying to prove us to see whether we'll love him, whether we'll follow him, whether we'll look into what he says. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, jump way up uh, to chapter 30. Again, this reminder in verse, uh, way down verse 20, right at the end of that chapter. After all these things, it says that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. Where's life come from? Well, you see, preacher, we, uh, we just, uh, there was this big bang years ago, and just everything blew up, what everything? All the stuff that was there. Oh, where did all that stuff come from? Well, it was just swirling gases, and where did all that gases and stuff come from? Well, you know, in the in the beginning, as it was the beginning of what? They, these are these are uh, these are a tailless dog chasing <laughs> chasing a, a t phantom tail. They can't ever get there. There's no end to their their uh, their search, and they, there's no way they can find God. They've already eliminated him as the answer. It isn't that they're searching for truth. They're searching for a way around the truth. Uh, some of the, uh, the eight most notable atheists, Huxley and, and uh, all those guys, they acknowledge readily the reason that a man becomes an atheist is because the only answer is to believe in the morality of a holy God. And they weren't going to do it. So they replaced the holy God with a, with a lascivious nature of nothing. And it, pro it provides a, a nihilistic life. You may know what that means? Yeah. There's no point. It's all futile. Why do anything right? We read in uh, Malachi there, that was, that was what the priest said. What profit is there in serving God? I mean, after all, you're just going to die. Well, if there was no life after, if there was no promise of eternity, if there was no conditions on which we'd stand righteous before God, you might agree with them. Eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow we die. But God says you're going to stand before him and give an account. That ought to terrify every single lost man in the world. But they've so conditioned their mind, God is not at all in their thoughts. They, they, they cannot even conceive of a God that is against them. 
They can't even conceive of a God that is for them. And sadly, far too many Christians live in that life. They can't conceive of a God that would think other than they think. But God tells you right up front, He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. As heaven is above earth, so are my thoughts above your thoughts. Well, amen to that. Man, they don't have to be very high to be above mine. All I have to think about is how it's going to come out two days from now. They, uh, God's that far ahead of me. He's got it all figured out. I ain't even got the questions formulated. You know what God wants us to do? And each one of these things is sort of pinpointed the same thing. He says, I want you to love me. How would you feel about meeting a woman? She says, I just want you to love me. Really? Why? Well, I just, it sounds, I mean, it's bizarre, isn't it? And yet God says to every single person, well, imagine God whispering to Adolf Hitler, I just want you to love me. <laughs> imagine him uh, to, to Lenin and Stalin, I just want you to love me. No, no, no. They had their own plans. They had their own thoughts. And God couldn't get in there. Imagine if, if Lenin... Stalin, Hitler, and Mao had trusted Christ as their Savior and followed Him. What a different world we would live in today. And yet, no, they're going to have it their own way. They didn't need that God. No, they could, between, the, the, between those five men, they probably killed close to a billion people. And yet today's youth are running after them. Hillary Clinton praised Chairman Mao. Some of the Democrat leaders, well, those Chinese, they, they really got a good government there. They got, are you kidding me? They would take your second child and execute it. They would, if you, if you don't worship their leaders, they'd put you in a concentration camp, work you to death, and not even apologize to the corpse. America's in a perilous situation, folks. Depends on you and I. Say, well, that's a, that's a pretty hefty load. Yeah, it is. You and I are the ambassadors of, of God's mercy and kindness, of God's truth, of God's uh, coming kingdom. If we don't tell them, just like Matthew was talking about, if we don't tell them, if we don't acknowledge there's a God that uh, is good. There's a God that has uh, the final say on everything. And we're hanging on to Him for everything we got. How's this world going to know that? And why would they care? He's your life. He's your security. Joshua 22. We're not going to read these because time is fleeting. Joshua 22, 1 through 5. Talked about the Lord your God and the need to cleave to Him. You know what that was? That was those people, they, they got harnessed to battle. They came across the, 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 uh, the Jordan River and the Reubenites and the Gadites, uh, uh, I think it was. They said, man, we're, we're cattlemen. We, we like it over on this side of the river. And uh, Joshua said, you, you can have that land over there. That's fine. But you've got to help your brethren win the battle before you rest on, on your land. they got to be able to rest on theirs. And they said, okay, we'll do that. And they went off and they fought and they fought and they fought. When the battles were won and everybody was settled in their land, he says, now go home, claim your land. And thank God you loved the Lord and you kept your word. You did what you said. You know what? There's no place for you and I to rest until the battle's won and the battle isn't won until we're out of here. And yet this world just, I'm just tired. I'm tired too. I'm just tired of being alive. <laughs> Every morning that wakes up, I wake up. My wife says, how'd you sleep last night? I said, uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had to go to the bathroom. Good change. That's just crazy. He said, well, I just don't feel like that. I think life is wonderful. Yeah, I did too one time. You wait. You grow out of that. Listen, I, I'm not moaning and I'm not, I, I don't mean to complain. I'm just pointing out the obvious. The longer you live in this world and the more you know about God, the more you recognize this ain't the end of the line. And thank God it is not. 
hang on to God, hang on to His promises, hang on to His love, hang on to His mercy, hang on to your wife, hang on to your children, hang on to your family, hang on to your church, hang on to the Lord, hang on to everything you got, and don't give anybody any of it except what the Lord tells you to. You know, when, uh, when Israel was down in Egypt and uh, they were, Moses is pleading with Pharaoh, let, let my people go. And he says, who's the Lord that I should obey him? He says, you're going to find out. And you're going to be sorry when you do. And ultimately, uh, through a series of uh, plagues that God brought, Pharaoh says, well, well you, can, you, can take the, you can take the women with you, but you leave the children behind. You know, it'd be rough on kids out there. You don't want to take those children out. And some people, well, we can't have the kids staying up late on Friday night, Sunday night, I mean. Can't have them stay up late on Wednesday night. You mean to tell me you're so concerned about them, you'd, you'd rather have them miss church? Now, and I understand they can't do that all the time, maybe. But you want to think about those kind of things. That comes down to learning to put God first over your own convenience, over your own comfort. Then he said... Well, leave the children behind, you can go. You know, you know what Moses told them? When we leave, we're not leaving a shoelace behind. We don't have any idea what God's going to want when we get out there. We're not leaving a shoelace behind. And old Pharaoh must have, you ain't going to have no reason to come back then, are you? Nope. <laughs> you know what this world thinks? You get too deep in that Bible. There won't be any hold this world has on you anymore. They're terrified of that. They can't imagine. You know what? They don't know what the love of God is. They don't know what the love of the Lord is. They don't know what God's grace and mercy, know what God's power is. They've not been proved by any of these things. They don't believe God did that for Israel. They don't believe God uh, destroyed those nations because of their wickedness and brought people in to manifest the righteousness of God and His laws to the world. They don't believe that for a second. That's why the world hates Israel. The devil knows it's all true. When somebody says, well, I believe in God, if the devil believes in God and trembles, he ain't saved. He ain't trying to follow the Lord. He just knows where to fight. Joshua told them in his dying, he says, I'm about to go the way of all flesh. You know what he knew? There's a great temptation when the powerful leader leaves, when the guy that you liked leaves, when somebody that you had some regard for leaves. I believe the expression is when the cat's away, the mice will play. As soon as Joshua's gone, we can, we can ease up on this stuff. You know, he was kind of the, the unifying force. Everybody have a family, and in that family, there's somebody that is the figure that holds everything together. Somebody that organizes the Thanksgiving dinner and the Christmas party and this and that. And when they're gone, you know what happens, right? There's, there's no more get-togethers. Or there's none that ever quite rise to that level because the unifying figure is gone. And they figured Joshua's gone now. And Joshua's warning was, and you better cleave to the Lord because it was never about me and it was never about Moses. It was about two men God allowed to guide you to tell you who the God was that was giving you freedom, who was giving you property, who was your life, who was your security, who was the one that loved your soul, the one that, that raised you up out of this, the ins insignificance of humanity. And gave you a place as the high point of the whole world. And will one day glorify Israel as his people. Boy, what a sad kind of thing. You know what the disciples said? Jesus told them, the, must have been dealing with a bunch of non-Catholics. <laughs> and after that whole discourse on the bread of life, it says many of the disciples were offended at that and went away and followed him no more. And he asked Peter, that smaller circle, he says, uh, will you go also? And they said, Lord, where would we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Yeah. Boy, you know what that is? That is the revelation that 
It doesn't matter what the rest of the world does. You and I know who he is. You and I know what he's done for us. You and I have seen the great miraculous works that he's done in our lives. Let's cleave to the Lord. Let's not let anything try and uh, come between us. Let's not let anything rise up to a, a level of importance where it could diminish our walk with the Lord. We ought to cleave to the servants of God. We ought to cleave to the, to the, to the preacher of God. We ought to cleave to the house of God. Now I put all those together because I don't want to make one sound more preeminent than the other. When we gather together as a church, that isn't just so that I can have somebody to preach to. It isn't just so you have a preacher to listen to. It's so the world has a testimony. There's a group of people still getting together after 2,000 years to hear the words of the living God taught to them so they can go out and tell the world what God said. It's a testimony to this world that everybody hasn't given up on. Some of them are still cleaving to what he told them back there in the garden, what he told them on that mountaintop, what he told them as he came out of that tomb, what he told them as he walked with those disciples on the Emmaus Road. And he said, you fools and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. It's a reminder to us, cleave to the words of the prophets, cleave to what God said, cleave to the truth. Don't let anybody rob you of it. There comes a time when people are, are turned away. People get mad. Paul wrote about uh, 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 Philem, uh, it wrote, wrote about uh, a couple of guys that uh, uh, Phil, uh, Philegius and Hermogenes. These guys had turned people away from him. Paul would no longer even accept it in the churches that he'd established. He didn't get mad at those churches. He told them what to do with those guys. He said, God's going to take care of them. Those guys are heretics. You don't follow them. You don't listen to them. Find out what's true and follow it. Cleave to the truth. There's a man in, uh, I believe it's in 1 uh, first, first Samuel, 2 Samuel. The mighty men of David talked about uh, defending a little pea patch. <laughs> He stood in a field of lentils. Those are, those are little tiny beans. He says, and he fought till his hand clave unto his sword. Did, did you ever hammer something or do something and you just your hand just kind of seizes up on it? Well, that was that man. You know what? I bet he wasn't. Oh, I got a, I got a wicked cramp on my hand. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> I bet he's glad. If, I, if my hand had not claved to that sword, I could have dropped it. If I'd have dropped that sword, I'd have been a dead man. But I think what's interesting about that is not that he stood there and fought them all off, that he fought over the value of a pea patch. Because it was his property. It was God's property. It wasn't something he's going to give up. We think, well, you know, you've got to choose your fight. Yeah, I'm choosing the ones that God has. It's truth. It's not truth with a capital T. It's truth in its smallest letters and its most microscopic fashion. When you think about the truth of God's word, which truths are you willing to sacrifice? Which truths are willing to, well, let them go for the sake of unity or peace or, well, I'll just get along. You can't let any of them go, friend. You got to hang on to every one of those truths. The, the smallest truth God has is a revelation from glory. It's what will separate you from the other masses that are wrong and have no idea what they're talking about. And I'm not talking about being mean or disagreeable or hateful to people about it. I'm just talking, stand up and defend what's right. They will understand who's in the wrong. Far too often, God's people seem to think this idea that niceness is somehow godliness. Niceness is usually just another word for muck, 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 muck. chicken. Don't want to fight. Well, I'll just be nice. They'll like me. They won't hurt me. You know, there's way too many people who have no attachment to their Bible at all. They can lose them, forget them, drop them, throw it away. Oh, I'll just get another one. I was talking to Brother Darren today, and you look at his Bible. He, he does what I do. If something happens in your life, you write down little notes in there. What? I'm forgetful. I, he may do it for a different reason for posterity. One of these days when they write a book about him, they'll, they'll, <laughs> they'll have all that stuff available. I do it because I forget it. 
But I look through that Bible, man, that's, there's some monuments in there to me. The Lord knows what they were. I know what they were. The world might not care. I don't care what the world thinks. To me, they're important. I don't want to lose that book. I was talking to somebody the other day. I got a, I got a Bible at home on my desk. It's got one of the fanciest covers you can get on a Bible. It's some kind of fancy goat skin or something. And uh, it's, it's a brand new Bible like this one. It, the pages are not all falling apart on the edges from, from fingers and stuff like that. Not all smudged up from spilling coffee on it and, you know, doing all that kind of stuff on it. And every time I pick that thing up, I look at it and say, eh, I go back to this one. You know why? I got a connection to this one. I say, were you worshiping that? But, oh, no, no, no. It's, it's not anything like that. This, did, did you ever get a letter from somebody and you read that letter and every time you read it, man, you, it's like stepping back 20 years or it's like thinking about something that's so sweet and so, so dear to your heart. It was, well, why don't you type it? And that way you'll have a fresh copy of it. <laughs> that won't work. That won't work. You read the newspaper. It's personal. There's something in the way God uses that book to reach to me. Don't let the devil take that sword out of your hand. Let that hand cleave to that sword. Do not let that thing down. Don't let it get slack. Stay in practice with it and use it. When we think about a physical sword, God says, see that? That's what that is to a Bible believer. Taking you the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You realize you've got a shield of faith, but that's to stand there and just take a beating from the world. Whatever they throw at you, put that shield up. But when God says, take that hill over there, you can't take it with a shield. To be, be on the offensive in this world, taking ground, takes a sword. And God has given us one that has proven itself faultless over centuries, millennia. It still works. It still accomplishes it. As a matter of fact, the Bible says back in the book of Job that only he who made him, talking about uh, Leviathan, says only he that made him can cause his sword to approach unto him. There's only one that has the ability to be offensive toward the devil himself, and it's the one God made. Don't let somebody snatch that thing away from you. Don't lose it. Read it. Believe it. Practice with it. Anybody ever see Princess Bride? Anybody ever see that? Everybody's afraid to admit they see it. <laughs> I think that's one of, the, one of the, the most hysterical movies ever made. In this thing, one of the, the, theme, the scenes is the, the hero of the thing is, gets pulled up this cliff and the, the, the guy that's supposed to kill him starts fencing with him with his, with his left hand and they fence for a while and they, they see how good they are and he says, uh, well, you're pretty good. He says, but I'm not left-handed. And he puts the sword in his other hand and the other guy fences for a while and he's fighting him off with that and doing pretty good. He says, I'm not left-handed either. <laughs> I think what the devil thinks is somehow, if I can just get a phony sword in their hand, it won't matter what hand they use. There's no practice that goes with it. It will fail when it needs to be sharp, when it needs to be pointed, when it needs to slice and cut. It will fail. Not that one. Not that one. That thing's been proven. That thing's been tested. That thing's been through the fire. That thing's delivered the saints. That thing delivered our nation into liberty. You know, when people today, the, the, there's one side of our political spectrum that says there's nothing exceptional about America. That just shows you, you should never consider these people even Americans. I, I hate to be that divisive. You should never even consider them Americans. They don't understand who we are. 
America is the only nation in the world that ever allowed its people such great liberties and freedom and restrained the government at every level. The Bill of Rights, the Constitution, is not telling the government what it can do. It's telling it how far it, what it can't touch. And it can't touch anything of those those enumerated uh, rights. And if it's not enumerated in there, it isn't theirs. It isn't. They get to pick up whatever they want. There's nothing else in there. That, all those laws limited the government, not the individual. That's the same thing with that book right there. That's, that's to tell you what the devil can't do. That's to tell you what God will do if we just press the issue. Just as David's mighty men were victorious in their battles, that man was victorious. His tool became a part of him. His sword became part of his, his, uh, his hand. He clave to that sword. That sword clave to him. He couldn't let that go if he wanted to. He realized this is, this is for life. I can't lay it down. You know what he needed to do? Look one more place when we done. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Let it be honest. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. You know what? As this, this year expires and another year rolls around, God willing, need to love the brother, love the brethren more than ever. We're going to need each other more than ever. We're going to need to pray for each other more than ever. We're going to need to be faithful to God for each other more than ever. As this world gathers all of its powers and all of its resources against the church and against Christ and against God's people, it'll take a unified force to stand up against it. Let's cleave to the Lord. Let's not let the devil, the world, this old flesh, have one minute of opportunity to come in and begin to cause problems. Stand for the Lord. Let's stand. Stand for that which is good. What a simple thing. Let's see here. Uh, three twenty two, three twenty two. 